Okay. Hello and welcome. We uh, started the class uh, last week learning Megillat Esther from the perspective of Mida Keneged Mida, measure for measure. And we described, we discussed in some detail how to uh, understand what measure for measure is uh, based on the Gemara in Megillah. Um, and also the uh, we talked about the famous um, comment of the Nefesh Achayim, that Hashem treats everybody according to the way that they treat him. So as the Gemara says, uh, and again, Megillah Yud Bet Amud Bet, um, the, the, the important phrase is, oops, what's happening here? One moment. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, well then. Uh, uh, sorry, technology is, like I say, wonderful things sometimes. <laughs> and sometimes not. The... Uh, uh, yeah, so the Shabamida uh, Sha'adam Moded Ba Modedim Lo. The way that a person acts is the way that this person is treated back. So everything you do, everything you say, every single action that you perform all comes back to you somehow. That's the concept, and that's clear throughout Megillat Esther. Uh, why it's important to us is because it will hopefully shine a light on a very famous question. And the question was, is, why is Megillah Esther in Tanakh? Now, you might say, because it's a Megillah. All Megillahs are in Tanakh. And the answer, that's not a really good answer, because that's not historically true. There are a lot of other books. The Gemara a few days ago in Daf Yomi mentioned The Wisdom of Ben Sira, famous book in, in, that's not in Tanakh, as part of the what we've spoken before about, called the Apocrypha. We talked about the book of Maccabees during Hanukkah time. That's in the Apocrypha. It's not in Tanakh. There are other books, also perm-related books, that are not in Tanakh, that are also in the Apocrypha. And so maybe Begillat Esther belongs there. And so there's a whole discussion in the Gemara of how Esther convinced the Chachamim, how Esther convinced the rabbis who are making up the biblical canon to include Esther in the book, to include Esther in Tanakh. That Esther is a holy work. It's not just a historical work. It must have been a hard sell, frankly, because it doesn't read unless you read the commentaries, unless you, you look at, uh, you know, you, you look at how the rabbis understand things. It's, it's, it's hard to see how Megillat Esther is a holy book. Yes, at the end, the Jews, you know, the, the Jews accept these extra mitzvot. So that's, that's very nice. But, but meanwhile, Hashem's name is nowhere in the book, right? The, the main, the title character marries a non-Jew. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's not an easy, it's not an easy book to just include in the holy scripture, right? as uh, some people would call Tanakh. So the fact that it is included means Esther was able to convince the rabbis. And one of the ways that she was able to convince them is by explaining that this is a great way to teach this particular lesson that we're learning now. That's Mida Keneged Mida. That everything that a person does goes back to them. Right? So just to recap the last class, we had several examples. I count 
I think I counted something like uh, six examples already that we've already gone over. We have another six, hopefully, today. Uh, so lots of examples of Mida Kenegad Mida, even ones I didn't mention are, are mentioned by other uh, commentaries and the, the Gemara uh, elsewhere. So uh, somebody asked me, uh, interestingly enough, this is a good way probably to start the class. Somebody asked me a few days ago, um, why is Vashti so bad? And this, by the way, in case you haven't heard, uh, in certain circles, um, I, I'm, I'm afraid to call them feminist circles because they're, 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 it's, it's a very broad category. Um, but in certain, in certain, uh, I would say, uh, left, uh, left of, uh, left of the middle aisle, um, uh, feminist circles. Uh, the, the Vashti has become in, in the last few years sort of a heroine because if you read it, the story without commentary, what happens is Achashverosh and his uh, and his advisors, his uh, other his governors, whatever, are having a discussion, and then Achashverosh orders his wife to come out. Um, it, uh, I'll, I'll read you the. I'll just read you the the, the verse. <coughs> On the seventh day, this is uh, chapter one, verse ten. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was like uh, it was gratified with wine, he said to his uh, list the name of his seven um, eunuchs, advisors, workers who served before the face of the king Akashverosh to bring Vashti the queen before the king in the crown of royalty to show the nations and the officers her beauty because she was good to look upon. So he's just showing her off. She's a, he, she's in in lots of ways his trophy wife. He wants to show her off. And what does she do? Like any good, strong uh, female character, she refuses, right? And Queen Vashti refused to come according to the words of the king that he sent through the chamberlains. And the king became very incensed and his anger burned inside him. And so then he wanted, then he needed to know what to do with her. Meanwhile, what, and whatever he does with her, whether he kills her or exiles her or imprisons her or all kinds of other options of what he did with her. Uh, either way, she's gone and now she needs to be replaced. And that's how Esther gets into the picture. Meanwhile, nowhere does it say that she's evil. Mm. But we say in Chazal, the Chazal say the rabbis, the Midrash, the Gemara, it all says that she was evil and she was a terrible person. And the way she treated the Jewish girls is how she was treated. Where do you see that in the text? In the text itself, without commentary, it's a very it's a very hard thing to to prove, unless you look more carefully at the text, like the Torah Tamima does. So that was the question I was asked: Why is she evil? Where, where do you see that she's evil? Now we know the midrashim say that she she uh, made the, the Jewish girls uh, work naked, and then she made them work on Shabbat. And there's midrashim that say that she was instrumental in making sure that the the Beit Hamikdash would not be rebuilt until uh, right until after quite a bit after she was dead or gone was uh, was the uh, was the uh, Darius the uh, second the king after Achashverosh was able to uh, allow the Jews to to go back to uh, was uh, allow them to go and rebuild the temple we say that Darius the second might be Esther's son right. Achashverosh so, doesn't seem so bad either, kind of, right? Right. Uh, also, I mean, uh, yeah, we, we kind of have to and make up our mind. What did he really do that was so terrible? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll give uh, just an attack. No. When when it comes to Achashverosh, what 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 uh, what most people say what made him so evil is that when Haman wanted to kill the Jews and offered Achashverosh ten thousand talents of silver. What does Achashverer say? It is good for the king. They should be destroyed. And keep your silver. He's being, he's being bribed, which is awful enough, to, uh, to exterminate a people. Men, women, and children, literally. Right? Right? And, and, and he agrees. And not only does he agree, but he agrees and gives back the bribe. He's that evil. 
No, I, I, there's no way to kind of like there's there's no I don't see a way to whitewash that. Interestingly enough, keeping in mind one of the reasons why the text is so how do you say pariv on the subject of who's good and who's bad, et cetera, et cetera, is because the the text is actually according to most opinions is part of the annals of Persian history it is an official court document. So it needed to be, that's why it doesn't have Hashem's name in it because it needed to be sort of like uh, Persian friendly, right? Uh, and, uh, and, and to, to do that, it needed to, uh, to not be explicit about the sort of the, the, the Jewish aspects of, of the story. That's why there's no God mentioned in it. That's why there's no, uh, that's why Achashverosh doesn't seem like such a bad guy. But yeah, if you read the text carefully, you can, you can see that, uh, that, that he's not such a tzaddik. And back to my question about how do you know that Vashti is so bad? Not really my question, but some, a question somebody asked me. And you have to do what the Torah Tamima does, and you have to look back at the text. So in the text, way back when, when it said that uh, that he was uh, that the king uh, sent for her, the previous verse it says uh, in the previous few verses it says that this was a hundred eighty day feast, and this was the seventh day. This was the seventh day. What is the seventh day? You could have said it's it's it's, it's uh, uh, in in Hebrew if it says uh, it's, it's different than in English. In English, you have to say the seventh day. It was the seventh day of something, but it doesn't say what it was. So let me, let's, let me find you uh, what, it, what it says that. Uh, this is verse 10. It says, Lo Gida Esther, uh, no, that's not the right, right verse. Hold on, Hebrew, uh, 10. Bayom Hashvi'i, Bayom Hashvi'i, Ketov Lev HaMelech Biyayin, Amal So So as on the seventh day, that was the day that he called for her to be brought to him. What is what makes it the seventh day? So, hey, the letter hey, when it's used, it's called hey how you do a, the known article, right? Which means that the thing that it's describing, right, the thing that it's an adjective for, or a preposition for in this case, you already know what that is. You have you already know the seventh day. What do you mean you know the seventh day? It means it's the seventh day that you're familiar with. What's the seventh day that we're all familiar with? Shabbat, right? So this happened on Shabbat. And the, that's what Chazal say anyway, but this is how the Torah Tamima says that there's proof in the text itself that this happened on Shabbat. And the relevance to you, and uh, to answer our question, is that Vashti was, uh, the previous verse, verse nine says, Vashti made a feast of women in the royal house which is Achashverosh, the kings. Now, the Shema was making a party too. And it was on, specifically on the seventh day that she made this party, because the seventh day is Shabbat, and that's the day that she can make her workers, who were Jewish, do that kind of work. So in the text itself, we see that she uh, that, that Shabbat is, is something that she made use of, and she made use of her slaves. So... Um, Going back to the text, if we may, and I think we may. Uh, there we go. This is the uh, source sheet I shared, or maybe didn't share. Very easy to find, measure for measure in Megillah Esther. Uh, so we looked at the Ben Yehoyada, we looked at the Gemara Megillah, you'd bet, we looked at the Nefesh Achayim. Uh, and we looked at Esther uh, chapter 1, and there's several examples there, the Gemara Megillah over there. And so this is just a recap. Some of the things that we said uh, include the fact that um, all of the names. So what, why was Akashverosh having this party? Chazal tell us he was having this party to celebrate the fact that the Jews did not rebuild their temple. And because he didn't have, uh, because he thought he had so much power, he had all these advisors. And all of these advisors' names all somehow refer back to the temple, showing that he didn't really have all that power. But he thought he did. 
and uh, the um, and then of course the Gemara in Megillah points out that in chapter two, verse one. When Achashverosh awoke from his uh, drunken stupor and realized that he had gotten rid of Vashti, however he did that, he was he not only regretted it, but he realized that there was some sort of connection. Vet ash zacharet Vashti, he remembered Vashti. Vet asher asata and what she did. Vet asher nigzar aleha and what was uh, decreed against her. So exactly the decree fits exactly what she did. That's the Gemara's proof that there is such a thing as uh, Mida Kenegh and Mida. It's not the only proof. There are plenty of other places where it's uh, where that's clear. We uh, we brought the Midrash. I talked about how the women of uh, Persia were uh, mistreated because they also, they were mean to the Jewish women uh, saying that they wouldn't ever win a beauty contest. So they themselves were brought into a beauty contest. Uh, and we talked about how um, how the uh, uh, Haman uh, used the word yeshno to uh, to say that the Jewish people uh, exist, which is the word yesh. But the yeshno, the Gemara says, is more related to the word yashan. The Jewish people are sleeping, and the fact that they're sleeping is why Hashem is, in a sense quote-unquote, sleeping and not uh, making sure that the Jewish people were not under his protection at the time. So that's why it would be easy to, for them to be destroyed. All right. So now we, uh, we're up to uh, the, the actual event has started to take place after many, many chapters in the book of Esther, uh, after the party, which had nothing to do with Esther in a sense directly, uh, and after chapter two, where, uh, where we're introduced to some of our main characters, and chapter three, where Haman is elevated to his, to his position, finally, 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 uh, Haman tries to bribe the king, as we discussed, and the king says, no, 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 keep the money, we're going to kill the Jews anyway. And then uh, at that point, the proclamation went out. How it went out is a matter of some debate and discussion. It's not so clear uh, whether people actually knew about it or not, or who knew about it and how. Who knew and when did they know about it, right? This is a famous, uh, for those of you who are familiar with uh, American history, uh, it's a, a famous phrase. Uh, so then, uh, then comes the fact that somehow, whether miraculously or through a dream or whatever, Mordecai knew about the, this, this decree, or whether he heard his decree, if everybody else heard it. Either way, he finds out about it, and he goes to tell the queen, goes to tell Esther, says, Esther, you need to do something about it, and the number one thing you have to do about it is you need to tell Ahasuerus, finally, that you are indeed a Jewess. And, and first, she's like, maybe not. Maybe it's not so safe. You know, I can only go to the king if he calls for me. He's got a lot of women. He, he, uh, to, to show up uninvited is, uh, is rather forward, and it's not something he likes, and he might have me killed. So uh, Mordecai says, you know, if you don't go, Hashem will find someone else. Don't worry. You're not the only possible savior for the Jews. But whatever happens to the Jewish people, your descendants... I can't, uh, I, I can't promise you anything. Basically, he's saying that you might not be involved in the rescue of the Jewish people if you don't want to be. But whatever happens, happens. Right? We're, we're, the Jewish people will be saved anyway. Hashem will find someone else to save the Jewish people. But this is your place. This is what you're actually here for. The whole purpose of all of these years, and this is probably like 12 years that she's been married to Achashverosh at this point, all of this time that you've been married to him was all for this, so that you'd be the queen now to save the Jewish people. Great. So uh, Hashverosh uh, then uh, is uh, is is uh, is um, before Hashverosh. So Esther finally agrees. She goes to visit the king. The king allows her to come in. He doesn't kill her. And what does she do? He says, you can have anything you want up to half my kingdom, and it is yours. Chazal tells us, what does it mean, up to half my kingdom? It means up to Yerushalayim. 
Why is Yerushalayim so much on his mind? Because he knows that of all the people in his entire Persian Empire who might rebel, the people who have the most uh, need to rebel are the Jewish people. And why would they rebel? To have their own land, to have to come back to the Holy Land of Yerushalayim. For everybody else, there's really nothing holy about their land. Right? You take a French person, you, uh, this, is a, this is a famous trick that ancient kings used to do. They used to uproot people. They used to like pick them up off their land, take them somewhere else, and generations later say, if you want to, you know, you can, come, you can go back to where you came from. So like, you know, you, you were like in the, you know, in, in, the, in the boonies in uh, Ireland, right? Uh, freezing, freezing in the, <laughs> freezing over there in, in, the, in, the, in, in, in the hedges. And, uh, and you were then picked up and brought to, you know, the Greece, right? And, uh, and, and then after a few generations, your, your grandchildren are asked, do you want to go back to cold Ireland or would you rather stay here on the beach in, in Greece? So they have to make that difficult decision, right? Like, why do you want to go back to Ireland? What's, what's pulling you there? Uh, you, 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 everything you have, you, everything you need is in front, is in front of you. You don't need have no reason to go back to your land. The Jewish people, no matter how great they have it wherever they are, no matter how nice America is, still have a natural pull back to their homeland in Jerusalem. Back to their homeland in Israel. And that's a normal, natural thing to do. And even Achashverosh recognized that. That's why he said, up to half my kingdom, and it is yours, not knowing that she was Jewish. And what does she say? He, she, by the way, at this point, she's supposed to say, I'm Jewish. Please stop this uh, execution of all my people. Please stop this, uh, th this, uh, uh, you know, th this, this killing. And instead, she says, um, I'd like to invite you and your main advisor, Haman, boo, to, my, to a party. So uh, he and, he, he's invited. He and Haman attend. They have a nice time. And at the party, he says to her again, what would you like, my queen? Up to half the kingdom and it is yours. And for whatever reason, she feels like this is not the right time to ask for what she really wants to ask. And she's right, by the way. Instead, she says, uh, I'd like you, you and Haman to come to another party the next day. This is, by the way, going. this is the first night of Pesach. So their party is actually on the night of the Seder. It could be that she made them a, a, a Pesach meal, which is probably why it's a nice party, right? Uh, there's brisket, there's, there's uh, you know, there's matzah, there's, you know, whatever. Anyway, so the uh, <laughs> first Seder. So the, the, the second Seder, which is the second uh, party, that's when, um, so he, the, she invites him to that party, and that's when she finally reveals her identity. But before we get to that, after the first party, that night, the king's sleep is disturbed. Right, so on that night, that particular night, something very strange happened, and the king's sleep was disturbed. And according to Chazal, he had a bad dream. He had a dream where somebody was trying to kill him. He couldn't tell who it was at first. He had a bad dream where somebody was trying to kill him. And he couldn't understand who is it. He had a feeling like it might be Haman. Boo. Why? Why Haman? Because he was invited to this party. So he's kind of like getting suspicious about his relationship with his own queen. Like, why is my queen inviting this guy to a two-person party? He's a third wheel that doesn't belong here. So... So all that being the case, he finally says to her, he, he's, he can't sleep. He's afraid that somebody's trying to kill him. And he's afraid that nobody wants to save his life. And, uh, and he can't figure out why. So he asks for, his, uh, for his, the annals of Persian history to be read to him. Right? And the, uh, and the book is read to him. And we said before, we said last time that the, the book sort of read itself. Right, which is a uh, the the book was read in front of the king, not like it, sort of like it read itself, and so the Gemara says to teach you that they actually uh, he the, the the words themselves read themselves. That was because whoever was trying to read it, the midrash explains. Uh, it says the, the Gemara there actually the Gemara uh, page fifteen b. 
says, Shimshai Mochek Gavriel Kotev. Shimshai was one of um, one of Haman's sons. I guess he worked for uh, for the king. Haman got good positions for his family, and uh, and he was trying to mochek. He was trying to erase the words. But Gavriel, that's the angel Gavriel Kotev, would rewrite them. Uh, and so the lesson here is that, uh, and also the Midrash, also uh, 10, uh, 2, if you want to look it up, um, brings up that uh, the, the next comment here. So the king couldn't sleep. He had, he, he's, he's wondering why nobody's saving him from this potential assassination or why nobody's telling him about this relationship between Haman and Esther. And so he has this, the annals read to him. And of course, Shimsha does not want to read to him the part where it says that Mordecai saved the king. Nevertheless, the book is read for him. The, re the words read themselves. And the king is reminded that indeed Mordecai, through Esther, by the way, saved him. So he does have somebody who, can, who will protect him in case somebody tries to uh, anything funny. And Esther isn't going to be the one trying, to, trying anything funny because she saved his life earlier. That being the case, the next question is, how did I reward uh, Mordechai? And the answer is nothing. You gave him nothing. Mordechai got zip, zip, zero, nothing, all right, nada. And so, uh, and so at that very same moment, just as he's trying to think of what can I do for Mordecai that, uh, that, the, uh, that hasn't been done for him yet, comes in Haman who's kind of like sulking outside in the courtyard, uninvited, in the middle of the night, because he had just, we, uh, the part I haven't read yet, the part I have I sort of missed, not missed, but haven't read in the class, is at the end of chapter five of Megillah at Esther, Haman came home and he and his family built the gallows together because he's so upset that Mordecai won't bow down to him. He's like, forget about it. I'm not just only going to kill the Jewish people, but specifically I want to kill Mordecai because after I was coming home from the party, he wasn't bowing down to me, and I'm too offended to let him live even a day more. I'm not going to wait till uh, the 11 months I was going to wait to kill the Jews. I'm going to kill him right away and hang him on this giant, giant gallows. How giant? 50 amot high. Were Where? they from Noah's Teva? Sorry? Were they from Noah's Teva? So there is a, uh, there is a midrash like that, yes. We just like uh, found out like last week they were talking about like the Teva and I was like, what? Yes. yes there's a Midrash that comes from the Teva. There's also a Midrash that says it comes from the Beit Hamikdash because 50 Amo uh, piece of wood is huge. We're talking, it's like sequoia size, right? Remember an Amma is- Stories uh, is that? Excuse me? How many stories is that? All right, so yes, good, good question. So an ama is uh, approximately um, uh, two feet. So we're talking about 50 amot would be approximately 100 feet, 10 stories, right? 10 story high building. Is your building 10 stories high? <laughs> okay. Um, oh, I was shaking. No. Oh, sorry, I didn't see. Um, uh, yeah, sorry for again. Okay. Yeah, so uh, so uh, I'm I'm pretty sure in Queens there uh, and in Flushing and whatever you'll you'll find a lot of buildings that are uh, that have a tenth floor. Yeah. So um, so that's ten stories high. That's how tall these gallows are. All right, huge gallows. And um, and. So anyway, so Haman is planning to kill Mordecai on this, on this gallow, but first he needs, of course, the king's permission because, first of all, Mordecai sort of uh, is an advisor to the king, sort of, a very minor advisor, but still there. So it seems to be at the gate of the king quite often. And not only that, but uh, to really kill anybody, to, like, he's going to be hanging him pretty high, he's, he's going to be quite noticeable. He needs the king's permission. So just, he's so enthusiastic about doing this. He just did. The, he just finished building this in the middle of the night. He runs over to the king to ask his permission. The king is sleeping. Keep in mind, right? So who's outside? Who's in my courtyard sulking around? And Haman came in. 
to the uh, to the uh, courtyard of the king. Uh, uh, he, he, the, uh, the out one, the outer uh, one. Apparently, there are other courtyards the king had. Of course, it's a palace, so there's an inner courtyard, there's an outer courtyard. To hang Mordechai on the gallows on the tree that he prepared for him. That he prepared for him. The Gemara again, Megillah 16a. Hechin lo, he prepared for him. Tana teaches lo hechin, for himself it was prepared. The gallows that, that Haman prepared were actually prepared for himself. We know that. We know the end of the story. We know that he was hanged. Sorry. Yeah. So um, I'm just curious. Do you think? Like Haman coming in the middle of the night, like potentially waking up the king, would that like be a death sentence too? <laughs> Dare you? Uh, so, dead. so he, so he was. I think he seemed pretty confident that the king would give permission. The king would be very happy about it. Remember, the king was happy about killing off all the Jews. So maybe, uh, maybe he thought the, the the king would be all for it, especially when the king would find out why he uh, hated Haman uh, Mordechai so much. That he wasn't bowing down to him, and that could maybe look bad for the whole kingship maybe maybe uh he could he could convince the king that indeed uh he he really disrespects not just me not just you know not just poor little haman but maybe he um he, he disrespects the entire kingdom right all right so again so uh the, the Midrash Esther Rabbah, this is 10 2, as I uh, referenced before. Litlot et Mordechai al ha'et esher heichin lo, tana lo heichin, alav namar. And this the Pasuk says in Tehillim, v'lo heichin clay mavet chitzav adolkim yifal, bor kara v'yach perehu v'yiplu v'shachat yifal. So uh, the, uh, the, the, Against himself, he gets weapons ready. So this is this is a beautiful concept in Tehillim that uh, that uh, He prepares. He who prepares weapons, heats of the Dolkin Yifal is himself going to fall on them, right? Somebody who's making weapons, somebody who's making war, very relevant uh, nowadays, I think. Uh, somebody who who's uh, who's shaking the you know, rattling the saber is probably going to be one of the first ones killed, uh, God willing. So uh, Hashem makes sure that uh, the evil people who try to threaten others are, uh, are, are themselves killed the same way. So that's, so th again, this is this concept, again, this ironic concept known as, uh, known as Mida Keneged Mida. Now, I'd like to share with you I have the text here, but it's not. Uh, but it's. Uh, I'm not going to read the whole thing. The Maharal of Prague, famous uh, rabbi, Prague, mid 1600s. So he um, he wrote a commentary on Megillat Esther called Or Chadash, the New Light. So that's it's actually there's two halves of it. The first half of the book deals with Hanukkah. The second half deals with uh, Megillat Esther. Either way. So Miguel Esther, he goes quite in depth, almost, you know, verse by verse, uh, multiple essays on each one. It's, a, it's, it's quite, uh, quite a beautiful book. I, I hope someday it gets uh, translated into English. Uh, I'm not saying, I, I, I'm not volunteering myself here. <laughs> it's uh, quite an undertaking. Kikach uh, Inyan Haman. So it says, uh, he, he quotes this idea that uh, just as somebody acts, uh, the, the the reverse is acted upon them. So now he says, interesting thing, he's going to use here what was at that point something very new, and that's Newtonian physics. Let me explain. He says, Vidome, this is similar to, what, how, how do you, how does this happen that somebody who acts in a certain way gets hit back with the same exact force? Doma Lemisha, who's Zorik, Bekoach, Gadol, Evan, El, El Kir, Barzel, right? 
It's similar to somebody who throws with great strength a stone at a, uh, at a metal wall, right? A metal wall. Imagine throwing a stone at a metal wall. What's going to happen to that stone? The hapil et akir. He's doing it to uh, to, to 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 hit to hit the 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 wall. As however nechpach al al hazorik, what's going to happen is if you do it strong enough, if you put enough force into it, it's going to ricochet and the stone is going to fall back. It's going to run back towards the person who threw it. It can hit you right square in the face if you throw it hard enough. Right? If you shoot a bullet. You know, this is a technology, uh, uh, another technology, right? If you shoot a bullet at something that, where it can bounce off from, then there's a good chance it's going to hit the person who, uh, who shot it. Just like Mordecai, Haman wanted to kill Mordecai and his nation. Asher Yisrael yesh lahem chuzek because the Jewish people have great strength in Hashem, the blessed Hashem, everything was thrown back at him. So the exact anger that Haman projected at Mordecai and the Jewish people went back at him exactly full force. He, he got hit in the face by the very rock he threw. The very, very same gallows that he built are his gallows. They are prepared for him. Everything is mida, keneged mida. It, the, the events that happened to Haman and eventually his sons reflects the very, very vehemence that, with which they planned to hurt Mordechai himself. So that's, uh, that's another example of Mida Kenegad Mida. And not just that, but a, a very beautiful sort of uh, physics uh, explanation of how that works. All right, let's go on. So the uh, Haman says, Boo, he says, uh, he, he, he comes in, he wants to talk to the king. The king says, before Haman even, even gets the chance to say, I'd like to kill Mordechai. The king already has a plan for Haman and has already a plan for Mordecai. He wants to know what, what should I do to reward Mordecai? So he asks Haman, Boo, how, uh, how should I reward Mordecai? And Haman says to himself, and this is one of the few times uh, the, the, the uh, Megillat Esther actually goes into the, Haman's thought process, not just what he says, what he actually thinks. And it says, it says, Vayomer Haman Bilibo, Haman said to his heart, he said to himself, Who would the king want to honor more than me? And so he goes into this whole litany of things that the king should do to honor somebody who, um, whom he should honor, right? And he says, he, uh, he should, should wear royal clothes that the king himself wears. So put the king's clothes on him, meaning me, right? Haman thinks it's, it's all about me. And, I, and, and put, uh, put the person on the royal horse. By the way, this is a king of Persia. There are a lot of horses, but there is one, like, you know, one, you know, uh, uh, how do you say, like display horse, right? Uh, the, the the one, the the, the parade horse, right? Uh, the the midrash actually, the the uh, targum Shani tells us the name of this horse was Shifragaz, by the way. In case you, ever, in case anybody ever asks you at a party, what was the horse's name? Um, <laughs> so uh, so he's uh, so put, put me on that, put me on that horse, put me in your clothes, put the crown of kingship on my head. Now, he doesn't say my. He's always he's he's smart enough to know that he should you know speak about himself in the third person. You know whoever it is you want to honor, <clears throat> uh, put him uh, in your clothes on your horse uh, wearing your crown. And there's a list of other things he asks for according to the midrash, but that's what it says in the text itself. And then the clothes and the horse should be given uh, to one of the officers. 
of the king and that officer uh, should be dressed also very honorably and that officer should basically pull the horse through the streets and should call out uh, so should be to the, the done to the man whom the king wishes to honor okay so far so good right all good things the whole list that he had for him and then the king says very much to Haman's surprise, he says, hurry, my hair, quick, take the clothes, take the, suits, take the horse, the ones you talked about, and do all of this, do all of this for Mordechai the Jew, who sits at the king's gate, so I guess Ahasuerus knew Mordechai, yeah, and don't, Leave out any of the things that you mentioned. Very nice. So now, question. Why is this how Mordecai is rewarded? Think about what Mordecai has done and what he's about to do. He's about to save the Jewish people. He's been, he's been uh, trying to get the, the Jews to do teshuva. He and Esther have uh, established a three-day fast, which, by the way, ran into Pesach, right? Men, women, and children all fasted the whole day, not just, uh, not just a daytime fast, but the 25-hour, 24-hour fast. So 72 hours of fasting, incredible amount of fasting, right? And uh, so why is... After he's done all this, why is he rewarded with this pomp and circumstance? Does he care about any of this? This isn't, uh, this isn't what Mordecai needs. In fact, by the way, the very, very next verse after, the, after this uh, all happens, what is, uh, what's, what's the next verse? Ch uh, chapter, uh, I guess, chapter 6, verse 12. Vayash of Mordecai el hat Melech. Right after this whole parade, Mordecai goes back to the Shara Melech. He doesn't go and celebrate. He doesn't go have a party. He doesn't go take a nap. He's, that's all. He goes back to where he was. He's unaffected by it. Haman nidchaf el beito evel v'chafui rosh. It's more. It's uh, it's more. It's uh, Haman who is affected. Who uh, who's who's all downcast because of this. Now back to what we were saying. Why is he rewarded for this particular this, in this particular way? So says the Menot Halevi. That it's precisely because of how he acted that he is treated this way. Again, Mida, Kineged, Mida. He acted in a certain way, so he's rewarded in the exact same way. How, is, how did he act? So back in Esther 4.1, when he first found out, right after the chapter 3, when Haman and Ahasuerus decide to kill the Jews, and Mordecai found out, it says, that what did Mordecai do? He put on sackcloth and ashes, and he walked through the streets of Shushan crying. To be very exact, the verse says, sorry, give me one split second. Mordechai yada et kol nasa. He knew everything that happened. Vi kra Mordechai et bigadav. He ripped his clothes. Vi obash sak ve'efer. He put on sackcloth and ashes. Vi etzeh betoch ha'ir. And he went out into the city. Vi yizakza kagadola umara. He cried a great and bitter cry. Because he went out of the streets. Because he paraded himself in this lowly way in sackcloth and ashes. Crying, embarrassing himself in front of everybody. That's why he gets rewarded by being paraded to the same streets, wearing the king's crown, the king's clothes, on top of the king's horse. Because this is twists in the story. This is where everything starts getting the hafaku. This is where everything gets turned around, and the same anger that uh, Haman had gets gets thrown back in his face. Mida keneged mida. Mordechai is rewarded also. Mida keneged mida. So, after this whole parade, which doesn't change the story at all, the Jewish people are still about to get killed, probably why Mordecai didn't really change his lifestyle very much, uh, why he's not too pleased by this particular event. But what happens is, finally, 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 after, during the second uh, party, uh, Akashverosh asks Esther again, 
What is it that you want? Up to half the kingdom and it is yours. Says the queen, me and my people have been sold. To be killed, destroyed, massacred, exterminated. We would have been just slaves and servants. If we would have just been sold like that. Then I would have been quiet because it's then it wouldn't be worth the king's trouble. But now we're not, I can't be quiet because me and my people have been have been basically been sold to death. And uh, according to the Midrash, Midrash Rabbah, which we have here, Zion Chav Hey, it says, why was Jewish existence uh, almost terminated here in Purim? So it says an interesting thing. It says, uh, let me find it real quick. Ah, uh, yeah. What is all so what is all this reference to? If you would have been sold as slaves, it would have been okay. So the reference is to her ancestors having sold one of their brothers to slavery, says the Midrash. Just like the Jewish people, right? The the Shifte Ka, the 12 brothers, or actually 11 of the brothers, 10 brothers, sold uh, Yosef eventually into slavery in Egypt. So too, this is this is somehow. It's related to this event. So the Sefer Shar Bat Rabim explains because of Mida Kenegad Mida, what Esther is saying, because of Mida Kenegad Mida, because everybody should act measure for measure, therefore it's not right that our punishment for what the brothers did should be death. They didn't kill anybody. They sold them into slavery. So sell us into slavery. It should be fair. In other words, and here's probably the most important point that we've been uh, sort of like sort of circling around this entire time. When we say that Hashem rewards and punishes the world, Mida Kineg and Mida, the most important thing to know about all of that is that we are expected to be like him in that sense. Obviously, we can't be like Hashem in every sense. We can't know everything. We can't be everywhere, right? We, uh, <laughs> we have limitations that Hashem gave us on purpose. But one thing we can do is we can, can, we can sort of try to, as best we can, to sort of copy his midot. One of his midot is midah k'neg and midah. So what Esther is saying here is that you, Ahasuerush, you're the king. You have a responsibility for there to be justice in this place. And one of the things that would make it just is for you to treat us the way we treated others. So yes, we were bad. Yes, yes, we should be punished. But don't kill us. We didn't kill anybody. We sold somebody into slavery. to sell us into slavery. All right. The king is very upset. He didn't know any of this. We don't know. Uh, it's not exactly clear why he didn't know about this. After all, we do have the, the end of chapter three, where it's pretty clear that he knew what was going on. Uh, there is an opinion that says perhaps it has something to do with the different pronunciation for the Aleph versus the Ayin, right? Because he, because uh, Haman asked the king to la'abed obeyed with an aleph to destroy but maybe the king heard obeyed with an ayin meaning to enslave like maybe that's maybe that's what he wanted to do was enslave the jews either way we're not going to get into all that that would sort of contradict what we just said from esther anyway i'm not going to get into all that the uh the important thing is clearly he didn't know anything about this very surprised right esther has to point to uh to haman eventually all right so Chapter 7, verse 7. The king got up because of his anger. He went to his garden. So Haman 
being the low life that he is at this point, he's going to beg Esther for his life. Because he realized that uh, the evil was decided, uh, uh, was already decided by the king, by a melech. By the way, we know Chazal tell us that every time it says melech in the book of, uh, of Esther, it's a reference to not just this melech, but also the melech, Malchei Hamlochim HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the king of all kings, Hashem. So the Vilna Gon points out an interesting thing. The Gemara in Megillah says that the king became so angry, he went to the garden to calm down. And what happened there? Melech Kambach Amato, Melech Shav began at the Beitan. He went to his garden, Bikei Shiva Lakima. He went to uh, he went to calm down. So now we have to be able to compare his shiva to his kima, to his sitting down, to his getting up. Ma kima bechema, just as he got up in anger, af shiva bechema. So to his sitting, when he came back, when he returned, was also in anger. Why? The azal ashkach lemalache hasharet the im the Idmu le kigavre, there were angels in his garden dressed up as people. And they were chopping down these devustame trees. They said to him, My of Daihu, why, why are you doing this? Haman told us to do it, which is, by the way, just so you know. A complete lie. Amman did not order these angels who look like people to cut down any more trees. We already have the gallows from Mordecai. They're already ready when Haman goes to get the king's advice or the king's uh, permission. And then the king asks him for his, his advice. So the trees are already taken care of. So this is a complete lie. And so the question has to be, the Vilna Gon says, why is the Midrash saying that the angels had to lie? You want to know why? You already know why. This whole class is all about why. Measure for measure. Mida connected mida. Hashem is treating Haman the way he treated the Jews. Measure for measure. Just like he lied about the Jews when he tried to get the Jews killed back at the end of chapter 3. So too Hashem is treating him the same way having angels lie about him. That's exactly the point. Again, Mida Kenegan Mida throughout this book. We have a couple more examples. We have a little more time left. A couple more examples, and I can take some questions if you have any. Very, very last thing we hear about Haman before he's killed is in, uh, is in this chapter, verse 8. Uh, sorry, verse 9, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Chapter 7, verse 9. There's this gentleman. I'm going to call him uh, loosely a gentleman. Uh, oh, wait. When, should we use this example too? Uh, uh, so, yeah, before he is uh, before he's killed, when he comes back to the room, he's angry. It says he saw that Haman fell onto the queen. He fell onto the bed where the queen was, uh, uh, right? Uh, he fell onto the bed that Esther was on. And the king said to him, You're going to attack the queen while I'm, at the, while I'm in the house? The word came out from the king. And Haman's face was covered. Why was his face covered? So says the Am Loez that there, uh, the 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 custom there was a custom to cover the face of of a, of, a, of a victim that was about to be killed, and the Am Loez says that that was Haman's idea, Haman's own idea of covering the face, which uh, relates to the story of uh, Vashti. Her her face is covered according to one way to read chapter one verse nineteen. So, uh, so we see that indeed uh, there's uh, Mida connected Mida there as well. Next example, 
Next verse. This guy named Harvona pops in from nowhere. Uh, he was one of the Sarisim, one of the uh, messengers, uh, one of the eunuchs, whatever you want to call it. Even the gallows that Haman made, the Mordechai was for Mordechai. It's in the, it's in the house of, of Haman. It's really, really tall. He didn't ask for your permission because right? Haman never got the chance to ask for permission. Hang him on that. Another example of Mida Kenegan Mida, because Haman was the one who gave, the, uh, we mentioned this last time, who gave authority to the king to kill whoever he wants without any kind of legal process or any kind of consultation or anything like that. Here too, uh, without, the, the, the word just came out, kill him, and so, so it is. Um, more, chapter 8, verse 1. The house of Haman was given to Esther. How is that Mida connected Mida? Remember, what did Haman want to do? He wanted to destroy everybody's life. He wanted to destroy the life of all the Jews. His own life is taken apart piecemeal, piece by piece by piece. His kids are killed. His house is taken away. Everything is just, he, there's like no memory of Haman at all. That's another example of Mida connected Mida. And yet more examples of David Feinstein, Zechir Tzadok Levracha, who was uh, still alive when we were giving this class uh, on Esther many years ago. It says another example of Mida Kenegan Mida is because Haman wanted to take away what was most precious to Esther, which is the lives of her people. Therefore, he lost what was most precious to him. What's more precious to him? His money. He cared more about money than anything else. Also, Haman wanted to hang Mordechai in his house. And where is Haman hanged? In Esther's house, right? The, his, the gallows are in his house, previously his house. Now his house is given to Esther. Now he's hanging where? He's hanging in Esther's house. He's on the flagpole in Esther's house. Exactly, again, Mida Kenega Mida. Everything is exactly the opposite of what he had planned. Just a couple more examples. We started a little late. We can go over time a little bit, I think. Uh, chapter uh, 8, verse 11. Uh, obviously, not maybe not so obviously, uh, a lot of people don't know really the main part of the story. What we're celebrating on Purim Day itself is the fact that the king allowed the Jews to defend themselves. He couldn't rescind his document. Because he would, it would be, a, it would show that he, according to the Malbim and according to others, he would, he would seem weak if he would go back on his word. So he had to keep his original document. All he could do was make an addendum to add to that document, and the only thing he added to it was that the Jews were allowed to defend themselves together with the Persian army against the attack that the anti-Semites would, uh, would, would, uh, would affect. And so. Um, the Mida Kenegan Mida says Rav David Feinstein again is that the Jews were then expected, as you'll see. The verse says, And the at the end it says Shlalam Lavoz means that they were supposed to plunder whatever they could from the people who would fight them. That's actually, says David Feinstein, an example of Mida Kenegad Mida. Why? Because back in chapter thir uh, 3, verse 13, Haman wanted the Jewish property be to be plundered. And just like they would have plundered their Jewish property, here uh, the Jews were supposed to plunder the enemy's property. Whether they did or not is actually an interesting argument, but it seems that they did not listen to that part of the decree any more than they had to. And the last example I have is um, is uh, yeah. Um, I think we can uh, so Targum Shani here uh, before we get to the, in chapter 9 verse 15 right? 
Vikalu Hayhudim Asher Bishushan, the Jews who were in Shushan gathered together, Gamba Yom Arba, Asar Lachodesh Adar, on the 14th of Adar, Yaragu Bishushan, Shalosh Mayot Ish, they killed 300 men in that one city. Uva Biza Lo Shalchu Al Et Yadam, and to their plunder, to their uh, possessions, they did not re raise their hand. In other words, they did not take what they were supposed to plunder. So says here the Targum Shani, interesting thing. It says, and I'm not sure this is uh, this is not all it says, but uh, just to just to be brief here, it says here that uh, the, they also killed off. Who are these 300 men? These are all leaders of Amalek. Yeah, Adar Mea Govrin. They were all from the house of Amalek. But they wouldn't touch their stuff. Right? And so how is that Mida Kenegad Mida? So um, who was wiped out? Who was Amalek? Amalek is Haman's family. So just like Haman wanted to wipe out the Jewish people, men, women, and children completely wipe them out. Haman is completely wiped out. He is, there's no, there's no generation of Haman left. Now, I know what you're going to say, perhaps. You might have heard that there's a Gemara that says that the grandchildren of Haman study Torah in B'nai Brak. There's a Gemara like that. So, uh, th so that, that requires explanation. But amongst other things, we can say that these aren't his direct descendants. These are not his... Uh, his, uh, how do you say, his, uh, his children, his, his, uh, uh, his kosher children, in other words, children from his wife. But we know that he was uh, sort of a philanderer. He actually had affairs with his officers' wives, according to the Midrash. And if we're going to take that Gemara literally, we can also uh, assume that, uh, that, his, uh, that these children were from those unions as well. Therefore, in conclusion, throughout Megillat Esther, we have this idea that Hashem treats others as they treat people themselves. That's Mida Keneged Mida. That's not just in Megillat Esther. We have it throughout Tanakh, throughout other Jewish sources. We had quotes from the, the Midrash. We had quotes from the Gemara. We had quotes from, from Tehillim, etc. There is this concept. But the most important lesson to be learned from all this, the reason why Megillat Esther became a Sefer in Tanakh is because the rabbis realized that we need to learn that lesson so that we will internalize it and so we will treat people as they treat us. We should treat people even better than they treat us. Mida connected Mida is how we, re we need to realize everything that happens. We go look around the world. We, we, uh, we, we see the news. We, uh, we, we read a book, uh, say it's a nonfiction book, and you're wondering, how could this happen? How, somehow, somewhere, deeper in the story that perhaps is not on the surface, somebody did something that deserved exactly that behavior. Everybody gets exactly what they deserve. Uh, I, I remember hearing uh, Moshe Mayor Weiss give the example of... Uh, you know, you have a, uh, somebody's car breaks down. And then, Why did my car break down? You know, I took care of it. I, uh, I, I maintenance it uh, properly. I give it the right amount of gas, et cetera, et cetera. Why, why did it break down? It's, it shouldn't have broken down. Well, the first thing he should do, says Moshe Mayor Weiss, Shlita, is that he should think about, oh, what have you done with that car? Do you do mitzvot with that car? Have you driven that car to do bad things? Do you make a kiddush Hashem when you drive that car? You know, do you uh, do you yell at people with uh, you know, with uh, your uh, your yarmulke in one hand and uh, you know showing certain fingers with the other hand? You know, the the it's, it, it it all goes hand in hand. There's there's a mida connected mida in the world. Hashem treats people as they treat others. This is not the same thing as yin yang. This is not the same thing as um, what do they call it? Karma. Right. This is this is a uh, this this is our of uh, this is our ability to serve Hashem 
in a way that that we see how he reacts to us exactly the same way just as, just like in the laws of physics each reaction has an equal but opposite reaction that's exactly what uh, we have here according to the maral and nefesh Achaim and all the other uh, rabbis we quoted uh, in the last two classes I, I hope you enjoyed and I hope uh, you, you take this lesson to heart and really a good trick, a good lesson uh, before I stop the recording. I think it's worthwhile to mention a very, a very good thing to do in your life is to maybe if, if you don't want to keep a, like a diary of, of these things, fine, but to try tomorrow, just tomorrow, try to see an event that happened in your life and try to think back to a similar event where you acted in a way that would deserve exactly that. Try that. Try as a, this is, this is not a VOD. This is not a, you know, Musr, Musr, Musr VOD. Uh, I'm not making you do anything, uh, you know, to uh, self-improvement, but it, it would be a good, it would be a good experiment to see that, that this indeed is how Hashem runs the world. Thank you very much. Shkayach. Baruch It's not yeah. Zahid, me. Right. I'm always, I'm always.